Cornel West starts a socialist party. You know, he's a Marxist humanist. He's a Christian socialist. He's something or other, right? He's a socialist. You know, he's honorary chair of the DSA for many years. Definitely a socialist. No right? doubt about it, right? Some kind of a socialist. Not really yeah. a Marxist. He wouldn't no. claim to be very rigorously Marxist. But he'd yeah. say, you know, Brother Marx is good, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. But we need Brother Jesus, too, right? Right. So, um, you know. Got to be wary of who he calls brother because he, I think. I know, it's always. His brother man. Adolf Hitler. Was some, and he was on Laura Ingram and he's like, Sister Laura. And I'm like, <laughs> all right, there you go, right? <laughs> um, so, um, you know, but Corn let's say he declares a socialist party. He's going to run a third party and he's going to call it a socialist party. In other words, it's going to be Bernie bro all the way. Mm. Right? Uh, no. Right? Because what he really wants is just a progressive liberal capitalist Democratic Party. And he's just, you know, he said something like, the Democratic Party is rotten to its core. And I just think, well, the rotten core metaphor is not really good because it's kind of like you, th you think you got this tasty apple but in the core is rot it's rot all the way out to the skin the democrats mm -hmm. we got to see that we can't say oh it looks good from the outside but it's rotten at the core it's rotten on the outside i mean come on Welcome back to the Catron Zone. The star of the show, as always, is uh, the last Marxist, Chris Catron. Uh, how you been, Chris, since you were on last? I've been doing well. How's it going, Doug? I don't know. I think I may have uh, finally gotten over my uh, raging period. Cancellation? Well, my cancellation... Um, I still hope to overcome. I'd like to get back on Twitter someday, but uh, I have to go all the way to the Supreme Court, and uh, Justice uh, Kavanaugh will have to decide the case. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I feel confident that uh, you know Kavanaugh will would side with me because I like he. I, well, both of us enjoy beer, so I think <laughs> exactly. Would, right. Um, uh, but but uh, I'm hoping here's my my big plan, and I have no idea how I'm going to make this happen. But uh, mm -hmm. I figured if I could get on Joe Rogan, mm -hmm. Elon Musk would see it. It's mm -hmm. like trying it's like trying to communicate with Trump or something. Like you know, uh, I got to get you on have to this, be on Hannity, uh, on Hannity to communicate with Trump or Absolutely. to communicate. Yeah. yeah, I don't I don't really want to communicate with Trump. I want to communicate with, <laughs> right. with Elon Musk because um, I don't think Trump could help me. Uh, get reinstated either that or yeah. rfk maybe rfk could help me if he could say i thought it was funny something like that that would if he um, could take a break from pumping weights yeah he looks good doesn't he makes me feel ashamed the, the well like if you're that. if you're a member of an american dynasty you ought to look that way right because you can have people you know yeah otherwise what's up. the point what's the point of being a member of an american dynasty if you can't be buff jacked yeah, totally. yeah. <laughs> i don't know i mean you could be in in really good shape but not not quite so pumped up you could be you know, that's true like you could be jared kushner right something you like know, that a soy but, boy <laughs> <laughs> anyway i think rfk could could beat biden in a in a wrestling match i'm gonna say well that. that's for sure <laughs> that's 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 not a difficult one right because you know in the last uh campaign uh biden was going around saying listen fat let's do some push-ups let's have a push-up contest things like that when he was out on the campaign trail like, well biden biden's in decent shape he is well for his age yeah yeah for his age he's in decent shape he takes bike rides i mean you know seems to be doing okay um, at the muscular level, at the mm -hmm. neurological level, you know, because they say that his gait, his stiff gait, is an indication of a neurological degeneracy as well. Oh. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. we've been through this before. We can do it again. Ronald Reagan was in a similar state, I think. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. But, uh, yeah, I, I guess over the last couple of weeks, what, what's, what has popped up? Wait, there's been the... Do you have anything to say about the submersible? Do you want to deign to say anything about that? I mean, uh, it's like a neoliberal story a little bit. 
because evidently they skimped on the cost and paid the price. You know, they were supposed right. to put a, a stronger window in the, in the thing, and they chose not to. They ignored the advice of experts um, to make it safer, and so they took their risk. And, you know, I mean, it's, you know, it's, pretty, miserable. it's a pretty miserable situation. Did you see that um, Barack Obama condemned the news coverage of the Titan submersible? Um, because he said that 700 people died off the Greek coast who were, you know, immigrants on a, you know, over overloaded on a ship and nobody paid attention to that, but they paid attention to the five rich people at the bottom of the sea. I didn't know that was from Barack Obama. I knew that was, uh, covered that some, something like that was said in the New York times. So I wonder which came first. Yeah. I don't know which came first. I know Obama did an interview with Christiane Amanpour. And, you know, she's, uh, I guess, like European correspondent for CNN. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of like, do Americans pay attention to European news anyway? Mm -hmm. You know, let alone something like this. Um, And, uh, you know, but then it turns out that, um, were you guys talking about this? The super yacht saved the people? Um, no, we didn't talk about the super yeah, yacht. Yeah, the super yacht. The super yacht w- was the first ship on the scene and saved what people could be saved as the ship went down. So they saved like over 100 people. Belongs mm-hmm. to a Mexican billionaire, and the name of the super yacht is the um, the Mayan Queen. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, so, you know, Mexican billionaires, you know, are all over the world. They're in the Mediterranean. You know, saving the day. Like saving that the day. day. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a shitty situation. That situation was really shitty because, you know, that the Italians and the Greeks are like kind of make ships carrying immigrants or migrants sink. Mm -hmm. You know, they sort of push them around. They drag them around. They tow them. They collide with them. They sort of it's very aggressive. They try to keep these ships from from landing. And so, uh, you know, and, and they do sit and watch as the ships sink. Yeah. The, and the Italians. And so, you know, I mean, people think that America has like an anti-immigration sentiment. Well, no, Europe. If you want to see anti-immigration, Europe, mm-hmm. right? An anti-immigrant sentiment, you go to Europe. Like nothing, you know, the U.S. What can't do you th- handle. Back to the submersible for a moment. What do you think about the fact that the Navy pretty much knew that it imploded like two hours into it, it having oh you know, i believe that they withheld it because they wanted to um have the item in the news to run interference for the hunter biden plea deal definitely okay oh, def- definitely i mean you know everything is totally scripted and clearly the administration works hand in glove with media and um you know and they're careful about these things about you know letting information out i mean it's interesting you know just thinking about that, um, I don't know if you recall this at the time. So there was, of course, around the George W. Bush administration, a great deal of criticism of the conduct of the war on terror. And it did seem like, you know, like black sites mm-hmm. you know, in Macedonia, or wherever, where they're taking people to be tortured. And these yeah, they, can, they created this category called enemy combatants, and then they could drag people anywhere in the world and torture them and detain them without charges and so on. So there was this notion that, um, and also there was complaint about the way media was allowed or not allowed access in Afghanistan and Iraq. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And so there was, you know, an accusation against the George W. Bush administration that they were not transparent. However, when the Obama administration came in, they were actually the least transparent administration in the modern media age. You know, they were, they had a very like locked up, buttoned up, like regime of information control. Um, And by comparison, of course, um, you know, Trump was pretty transparent, both in terms of his own (laughs) speaking, but also in terms of there was a lot of leaking. Um, a lot of hostile leaking from the administration. I think we're back to the Obama style regime with Biden. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that Biden runs a tight ship and I think that they're not particularly transparent. Um, no. And they sort of trade on a lack of transparency as well as a media lack of curiosity, you know, kind of turning a blind eye to a lot of things. 
And so, you know, I've been a big advocate in this era, in the Trump era and in the Biden era of paying attention to right wing news outlets like Fox News or whatever, you know, the Murdoch empire, you know, New York Post, the Hunter Biden laptop story and uh, Wall Street Journal, you know, because this is the only place you're going to get information, actually. Um, And it's the only place that you're going to get a kind of like sober assessment of things because um, neither Fox nor the New York Post nor the Wall Street Journal were particularly pro-Trump, right? Even though the Democrats and the left, like, imagine that these are, like, deeply pro-Trump media outlets. They're not. They're not at all. They Mm -hmm. were always critical of Trump throughout, from his campaign into his presidency and up to the present. And, of course, you know that they got rid of Tucker Carlson because he was too pro-Trump. Fox. Right. Yeah. And so, um, and they seem to be deprecating Laura Ingram. They're putting her at a earlier slot now. And she's also very pro-Trump. Now, Hannity is pro-Trump, but in a different kind of way. In mm-hmm. other words, um, it's Laura and Tucker would be more like your kind of like right-wing populist kind of pro-Trump people. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas Hannity is just a sort of straight-up Reaganite Republican who's also like personal friends with Trump and kind of, you know, is a Trump booster. But he's not going to tread into the tricky domains that uh, Tucker and Laura will, right, um, of, of you know, alleged disinformation, misinformation, conspiracy theory mongering. Hannity actually doesn't do much of that. Um, he sort of more just gives a platform to whatever the Republicans want to say, whereas Laura and Tucker will have like a spin, like this right populist spin in which they're very critical of the Republicans. Well, I, I, I think it's interesting that you would recommend that people read you know, right wing uh, newspapers watch right wing outlets in order to be informed about yeah. what's happening in the state. Right. Um, because I uh, was recently accused of reducing politics to the level of the news cycle mm-hmm. just, for, just for talking about, um, for instance, the, the origins of COVID. Sure. Or, or, um, Even uh, the Twitter and, files, right? Right. Could Twitter files was an, like, right. Yeah. Yeah, that that was the other thing um, that I, I you know wrote about. It was in response to my essay in Cosmonaut, which I'm going to uh, do a follow up essay if they'll mm-hmm. let, let me run it there still. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that there's something about the way in which the radical left, the Marxist left, uh, you know, such as it is, wants to rise above or not be involved in these sort of the pseudo left. Yeah, they adopt they, they they adopt their own sort of turning a blind eye. They follow the Democrats that way, right? Yeah, I guess. So. No, no, it, it they take their talking points and their orientation from the Democrats, and so nothing. But it's not like here. they're repeating the talking points of the New York Times per se, right? <clears throat> not always. Not 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 always way. on some things. It depends, right? It does depend on the right, on yes. the issue. Right. But I think that generally, I mean, the thing that always struck me when I was a member of the Spartacist League Mm -hmm. is that, you know, and the left generally kind of does this. I mean, of course, they have no choice but to do this, that they take the capitalist media and they just process the same information through Mm -hmm. a kind of ideological filter and analysis. And in a way, they don't stop and think, well, actually, the facts that I'm being given are very selective. You know, the left is not really in a position to do their own, like, on-the-ground journalism research. Very rarely are they. Like, individuals are. But I feel like the organized left, and especially the Marxist left, and the tendencies, the organizations, they just didn't do that. They just ran the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and The Economist, you know, and the London Times and the Financial Times, like, through this mill of, like, okay, we're just going to take the same facts we're going to take the wire stories, the Reuters and AP associated press stories, and we're just going to run them through the, our Marxist ideological mill. We're going to analyze mm-hmm. the same facts, but interpret them differently than the capitalist media does. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, well, that's a kind of a massive concession to how reality is being depicted to begin with. And, you know, like I said, they're kind of forced to do that. So one of the reasons why I myself, so in the, in the current book, The Death of the Millennial Left, like I do do commentary, right? Mm-hmm. But I wasn't going to try to do analysis. And the reason I wasn't going to do analysis is that where was I going to get the facts to analyze, Mm -hmm. right? I would be entirely dependent on something that already pre-selects 
and therefore distorts reality, <clears throat> mm -hmm. right? And so I just thought, well, you know, I, I'm aware that I'm being manipulated just at the level of which facts are presented, right? right? So being in terms of, I mean, I get the point, right? Don't be a victim of the capitalist news cycle for sure, right? But first of all, that's what we have. And second of all, okay, so how do you read it? Well, of course, you don't read it as facts. You read it as ideology. You read it as like a presentation of reality, um, you know, that is biased, if you will, or that has some assumptions. And so the question is, what are those assumptions? And not, to, you know, to kind of get rid of like the left has this kind of just so story, again, following the Democrats, mm -hmm. where they have a kind of a paranoid sense of the spin and the bias. And it's like, you don't have to be paranoid about it. Like, you don't have to think, oh, you know, finance capital with its hidden fascist agenda or something. You know, you could just say, well, they have a set of basically liberal assumptions and capitalist assumptions. Mm -hmm. They see things this way and not that way. They're not going to talk about some things that they think can't be changed anyway. So why bother talking about it? Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's, you know, you got to like, you know, have a way of, of filtering or interpreting or seeing, you know, but for myself, it is interesting just how things are being described. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, OK, I'm going to take the description and I'm going to, I'm going to turn my uh, alarm off on my phone because it's okay. making noises. Hold on. One OK. <laughs> Elon uh, Musk is, is uh, trying to contact you. Yeah, I hope so. That would be good. <laughs> right? uh, <laughs> no. So, you know, I think that the point is that we are all victims of the capitalist news cycle. So I decided like early in the Trump era. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't watching the news every day by any means. I was not. And I was resisting as much reading the news that was being fed through my okay, internet access. But then I decided, okay, the only way to deal with this 24-hour news cycle is total immersion. Hmm. Because things slip through the cracks. In other words, they say they tell us more than they intend to because they're not sure what where things are going. So they sort of throw things out there. Is this going to be interesting to people? Is that going to be interesting to people? Is this where the story is going? Is that where the story is going? And then they forget things, right? Like it just mm -hmm. gets memory hold instantaneously. Like once right. they figure out the narrative, then anything that doesn't fit the narrative is gone. But before that narrative solidifies, you get these little glimpses of things. And you're like, huh, that doesn't quite, hmm, that's interesting. That doesn't quite fit the picture that they're painting. Mm -hmm. that's what you got to do, you know, yeah. you, gotta, you know, you got to pay attention to the things that don't instantly make sense in the pre-digested way that they're, that they try to make them make sense. Yeah. One more go things. around on, on this. Um, mm -hmm. I just yesterday interviewed Ryan Grimm. He'll, uh, that interview will be out the day after this airs on, on mm -hmm. Saturday as a special. Um, always surprising, to, right? Uh, he's at uh, he's at breaking points now. Oh, excuse and, me, breaking points. What? Yeah, he's part of the crew that replaced the for old, a little while, right? Uh -huh. At Rising, and then they they kind of went through a rotation of different hosts, and uh, Ryan Grimm went over to Breaking Points and does uh, I think their Friday show there, and then he, wait, where's Crystal and Segar now? They're Breaking Points. They're Breaking Points. Okay, yeah. so they were Rising. So he also went through Rising and arrived at Breaking Points. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think he just stepped in for them. I don't think it was any bad blood between. Right, right. Uh, right. And so they, when when he was no longer going to be hosting at Rising, I mean, I don't know all the details, but all I know is he was a co-host at Rising for a little while. Now he's at Breaking Points on Fridays. The main thing he does is he's a journalist for The Intercept. I think. Ah, okay. I didn't realize. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, and he's been writing about <clears throat> the post Greenwald Intercept, though. Yeah, I think he was there before and. Oh, after, okay. But I don't know that for a fact. But the um, uh -huh. he is uh, at The Intercept and he's at uh, on on uh, Breaking Points and maybe he's still occasionally uh, co-hosting on Rising. Um, Why did you interview his, him? To, about the origins of the COVID. He had written in oh. The Intercept. Okay. About the origins of COVID. So the, okay. there was a, a Schellenberg Taibbi uh, report that came up. It was really Schellenberg's story uh -huh. about uh, the origins of COVID, most likely coming from the lab. Um, and people right. can hear all about this uh, tomorrow. But right. the 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 main 
point is that I, I do think it's possible to get at least a glimmer mm -hmm. of a, a true narrative mm -hmm. um, if you read the capitalist press, especially if you read both the right and the left. The left. Yeah, you got to pay attention you, to both for sure. And yeah. and what goes on in Congress is also important, like these Absolutely. hearings. Totally. Um, yeah. Uh, so, like, the, I recall when Fauci was confronted by uh, Rand Paul. Yes about gain of function and the way he yes. answered that question What's caused that? like a, it became a viral sensation amongst the left and of course the Democrats, but it was telling that he, I mean, he was clearly lying or obfuscating in that moment. And so one thing I asked Brian Grimm was, do you think it's fair to say that Fauci covered up the origins of COVID? And he said, Oh Yeah. We can say that with a hundred percent. Oh, absolutely! No, no, it's clear. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the FOIA stuff that's been revealed, um, mm -hmm. the uh, emails between him and his boss. Uh, I'm forgetting the guy's name now. I, I am. You know who I'm talking about? Well, there's a guy named uh, Redfield Francis. who was. Oh, okay. Um, I think uh, was the guy who was his boss. And they were talking about like we have to make sure that this thing is published in Nature in order to squash this other narrative. Yeah. Right. And this kind of stuff. I think it was right. the Lancet and not Nature. Oh, okay. Maybe it was Lancet. both. Yeah. Uh -huh. But but any anyhow, yeah. So on the A one British hand, journal, you, which means more reputable, right? I guess. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. I don't know, right? Um, <laughs> but you you uh, yeah you you basically I feel as though you don't want to get caught up in the narratives of the of the news cycle and the uh, certainly not the framing that the the yes. bourgeois or capitalist press gives everything. But on the other hand, you can interpret the information that they're giving you and to ignore to ignore the story about the origins of the virus is to ignore a story which is just, you know, obviously uh, and on its face uh, in the public interest. Like everyone should want to know how COVID. Maybe. I mean, let me play devil's advocate for a second, right? Okay. So the Democrats were like, you can't mention China because it's going to be translated into anti-Asian violence on the street or something, right? If you say about this virus and all the shit that we're suffering, and if you just say China, 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 then people are going to like beat up the first Chinese or apparently Chinese Asian person they see. And, you know, from, from a certain perspective, I mean, I know why they think that. Because they do sincerely think that. That isn't like an excuse that they give in order to hide, like, I don't know what, the, the interests of pharmaceutical billions or something. I think that they sincerely believe that if you say it's the China virus, you're going to have anti-Asian violence on the street. Yeah. yeah but, okay. But every story says it originates in China. I mean, it's not like it's right. not the China virus. <laughs> if it didn't come from but remember when Trump was, was confronted, why do you keep calling it the Chinese virus? And he was like, because it's from China. <laughs> right? right. And so but they were like, yeah, but why do you keep saying it? Right. And then, you know, it's just a funny. So as far as the, the lab leak, like, OK, so first of all, the problem with the left is that they don't really understand how reality works. So they think there's such a thing as like U.S. imperialism and American nationalism. And then there's like China. And so they, they think the United States is this thing. And then China is this other thing. No. Right, and it's just not the, the case. The, mo the money for the right. uh, gain of function research came from the United States. It also involved money from uh, the the Chinese military. Yeah, um, I mean the, the 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 way in which all these nations are intertwined. Yeah, is is stunning, and the fact that they could go to war despite that is kind well, of interesting too, right? I well, mean, remember how much investment there was by the United States in both uh, the Kaiserreich, Wilhelm in Germany, as well as in Nazi Germany, right. right? And remember that those companies that lost assets due to U.S. bombing got compensated, <laughs> right? So the American right. capitalists owned factories in Germany that were helping the German war effort and that were bombed by the United States, and they got paid by the U.S. government. It's amazing. No, I mean it's yeah. it's totally rational. It's totally rational because it right. is one world that we're living in, and there's actually one state that we're living in. There is a global capitalist state, of which China and the United States are obviously major players. Mm -hmm. And Fauci, I mean, this is this is why it's so important to pay attention to this stuff, 
and leave aside the paranoid details because you learn a lot, right? You learn that Fauci doesn't want to protect the Chinese because he's colluding with the communists or something. No. It's because he thinks this is how the U.S. keeps tabs on the Chinese, right? This is how you make the Chinese responsible is that you, you, uh, you know, maintain relationships between the U.S. government and the Chinese government and between American scientists and Chinese scientists. And if you, if you don't do this, if you don't fund research in China, you're going to lose access. And then we won't be able to see what they're doing. Well, what, right? whatever Fauci might think. He has there was a, said this. There, there was a ban, I know, but there was yeah. a ban on uh -huh. gain-of-function research. That in he the United States. Around. Right. But they, they have to but do that, it in these third-world that, countries. That would, that would include right. funding it. That would include funding it. Okay? They, got away, they got around it, right? Because they, they got, always do. Yeah. But that they means that do. he's saying, I know better yeah. than the president of the United States or yeah. the Congress. And and I know better, not in terms of science, but po about politics. Yeah, yeah. About about how to deal with these institutions. Yeah. Well, and he might. Let's grant him that. Let's grant him that he knows. I don't want to grant him that now. I think well, that he's, I mean, look, he's the so pandemic, betrayed. right? The pandemic, uh, and the way it, and the, uh, you know, the pandemic and the cover up exposed that his genius level, you know, fifth dimensional chess about world politics, maybe not that reliable, you well, know, because it's only one piece of the puzzle, right? In other words, he's an expert in his area, and his area is not like virology, really. It's really these institutional operations. This is what mm -hmm. he's really an expert in. Like mm -hmm. he knows how, you know, the pharmaceutical companies and various governments, how they work and work in tandem and work together. Right. And so mm -hmm. he manages that. I mean, that's what he's that his position is not as a scientist. He's a bureaucrat, meaning his expertise is in running the bureaucracy. And that bureaucracy is international and global in scope. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, what you need. So you need a bureaucracy. You do. But you also need civilian oversight over bureaucracy. Right. But the bureaucrats also need to not have the civilian oversight interfere too much. Right. So it's a constant push and pull. A constant. Right. In other words, mm -hmm. it never it never resolves. Right. Both sides encroach on the other. And this is just the way things are. Right. Mm hmm. Now, and, and it's what we talked about last time, and a certain amount of opacity, lack of transparency is actually required, meaning in order to get things done, some things have to be kept secret. Like, really? <laughs> and it's not just to cover your own ass thing. But that was right? an element of it. Of course it was. Yeah. But we can't ascribe it to personal failing or personal corruption, because that's neither here nor there. We have to ascribe it to its functional rationality. No, it's right. If it was simply that, then there wouldn't have been enough they would support just arrest within them. the Yeah, yeah. They would they would arrest him. If it was right. that, they would just arrest him. Right. But it wasn't just that. I agree with that, that, you know. Right. Yeah. But I, I, I just I tell you, that doesn't I mean I on a practical it's not this satisfying. Is the only world it's that's not possible. satisfying. Guess what, Doug? Welcome to the Catron Zone. Welcome to Marxism. <laughs> Yeah, it's frustrating and unsatisfying. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, changing the world is not a rewarding activity. <laughs> right. But I want to be able to say, look, Fauci covered up COVID and yeah, we, we the public. Right. Um, you know, should be and there should be transparency. So welcome so to the Republican Party, Doug. <laughs> right. Like you got some people out there who are pressing that case, and guess what? They're called They're Republicans. Republicans. <laughs> right now, right now, yeah. Right now, right? And I'm like, that's why I'm like, I'm not afraid of the fact that I might agree with people sometimes that I disagree with fundamentally, but I might mm -hmm. agree with them on this point. Yeah, but but you're yeah. right now, we gotta get to your your yeah. essay, but but right now you're saying well, Fauci didn't really I mean, considering all the reality of it, of course he had to do that. And I, and I don't, on a on a certain level, but I don't disagree. Also, for all the overheated rhetoric, for yeah. all the overheated rhetoric, you know, because mm -hmm. I was watching, I had sent you, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm Catron pilling you now, Doug. 
<laughs> I know. It's way beyond red pill or black pill. Now it's chrome <laughs> pill. So I was like, so you like the TEB hearings? Check mm-hmm. out the Durham hearings, right? Yeah, right. But then it's like fucking Matt Gates, and Matt Gates is like Durham. You're participating in the cover up, whereas up to that point, the Democrats were saying you're just feeding the Republican conspiracy theory. Mm-hmm. And then, right? So most of the Republicans are like boosting Durham. And then Matt Gates comes along, another Republican, and he says, you're part of the cover-up. Right. Right? And, and, and I'm like, okay, so where, where do you go from that? In other words, it's all this push and pull dynamic. Well, what was interesting it's about that was not rhetoric. just – he didn't just make a you know, Trump-like accusation based on nothing. No, no, it was – No, he walked him through yes. the, his own report and Absolutely. said – you know, uh, he, he and Durham would say, well, that was beyond the scope of my mandate. And he's like, no, I've got right. it right here. Right. You were supposed to find out about uh, the Mueller yep. investigation and why did they all in tandem wipe their phones on this date yep. at this time? Well, yep. you, and you didn't discover that. Right. You're you know, supposed to find out who the uh, person was that got that original tip in Australia uh, and brought it to the FBI. You never followed up. You didn't find out who that was, or you didn't tell us in the report. You never interviewed him. And of course, um, it's true that the investigators right. do cover up as much as they reveal. They did and- not. Right, but there was probably just Durham was facing opposition within the bureaucracy that was strong enough to repel him from doing the kinds of investigation. Like he, Maybe. like if you want to compare, it's an unfair thing to compare. Mueller's indictments to Durham's. Uh-huh. Mueller had all the wind at his back. Right. No one was going to stand in his way. That's it true. Was, and and Durham had nothing but headwinds the whole time. But, so the Democrats made a big deal of this, right? In those hearings, they were like, "Oh, how often were you texting Attorney General Barr?" Right. Yeah. And how much direction are you taking from? But they, that was muddying the water. That totally was totally muddying the water, water, right? Because right. I'm like, and what do you think they're texting about? Do you think they're texting about like a Trumpist conspiracy theory like investigation? No, they're texting about how do we investigate this without totally dismantling the FBI, right? Because in his opening remarks, Durham was like, I don't want to be taken the wrong way. The FBI still has an important role to play and an important job to perform. Mm -hmm. As opposed to Matt Gaetz, who's like, let's just defund and dismantle the FBI, which, of course, he doesn't really mean that. Right. That's no. the other thing is that all this rhetoric. So the Democrats are like your so-called investigation, you know, like Taibbi, your so-called journalism. They don't really mean it. This is the other thing. Nobody really means any of the rhetoric. And so you got to wade through all this rhetoric. Well, are you sure about the Democrats? Because yes. it seems to me that Plaskett meant what she was saying, you know. Oh, about Taibbi, yes. But Durham is something else. Durham is a federal prosecutor with a long mm-hmm. history because, you know, they went into it. They were like, well, you've been commended, you know, you've earned these medals for like, you know, prosecution and what mm-hmm. happened to you? Oh, oh, you, you signed up with Trump and you're going to end up on Trump's funeral pyre. And mm-hmm. I'm like, I don't mean any of this. What they mean is public don't pay attention. Like disqualify mm-hmm. this guy. But, you know, we know that this, this guy's one of our own guys actually. Right. And right. that's why Matt Gates was like, Fuck, who are you working for? Are you investigating the FBI or are you protecting them? Of course he's protecting them. Of course. Of course he's protecting them. And at the end of the day, Matt Gates would also protect the FBI. Of course. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and Trump, too. Like, you know, Trump can yell and scream about the deep state and this and that. He's not an enemy of the deep state. He's not. Not, not fundamentally. Yeah, no. how could he be? Right? Firstly, he's never going to be in a position you can't dismantle the deep state. This is impossible. And n- nor does he want to. He just wants them to be a little bit less obstructive and hostile. Right. Robert right? Robert Kennedy and JFK apparently were going to take apart the CIA. That's one of the stories that gets floated around. Um, and that and, you know, they were both killed. Uh, but I don't know. They if weren't going to do that either. In other words, they wanted to rein it in. I mean, the other story, check it out, because, you know, we're so in the Democrat world, right? Mm -hmm. That we're concerned about how the deep state acts against the Democrats. Well, what about when they act against the Republicans? And long before Trump, 
meaning certainly Eisenhower complained. What do you think he was complaining about when he complained about the military industrial complex? He was complaining about the fact that they blocked him. And of course, Nixon. Why oh, was yeah. it taken out? Why did Watergate come out? How did it come out? What is that really about? One of the very right. first interviews I did for Diet Soap um, mm -hmm. back in the beginning was with a guy named Peter Dale Scott, mm -hmm. who was one of these conspiracy writers, you know, mm -hmm. and he was like absolutely convinced that, you know, the Nixon impeachment was a deep state conspiracy. And no doubt it was. Yeah, right. No, that it was because the right. point of the matter is, is that everybody is fighting everybody in the capitalist state all the time. It's right. all backstabbing, palace intrigue, bureaucratic. I mean, it's literally they are trying to make each other fail. Like they're competing with each other, they're keeping each other in check, they're undermining each other constantly. I mean, that's what politics is now. Right. Mm -hmm. So what what they didn't like about Trump was not that he did anything. They didn't like the way he talked about it. Mm -hmm. Because in talking about it that way, you might show what's going on inadvertently. Right. So they say, oh, breaking norms and this kind of thing. Not actual norms in terms of policy, norms in terms of how we talk about it, because you're not supposed to talk about it. I mean, that's that's why they really took issue with Wiki like WikiLeaks and all that stuff, because, yes, the raw data, the facts are damning about the war on terror and this kind of stuff. But what's more damning is what a shit show the bureaucracy is. Mm -hmm. Right. And I mean, we know that and like at a certain level, we know this at another level, you're not supposed to reveal it. Right. Mm -hmm. Like it can be the fodder for like, I don't know, like TV series like Homeland or something. You know, you can like you can show how like people are trying to get each other killed who are on. You the can same. write a novel. You can you can make a yeah, movie. You can do a Tom Clancy novel or a Robert Ludlum. Like you can you can do it there. And it's like, but that that's really going on. That's actually what's happening, you right. know, and everybody is one step away from stepping outside the approved racket. And then right. you're prosecuted, sent to jail, or maybe you're run over by a car accidentally. I mean, you know, shit, of course they're, of course they're doing this all the time. Absolutely. I was talking to some platypus members about like, you know, the rhetoric between the Democrats and the Republicans and how they, you know, this civil war and, you know, it's like a cult, the Trump cult and, you know, the, the GOP are fascist insurrectionists and this kind of thing. On the one hand, they don't really mean it. They don't. On the other hand, of course, they have no problem sending each other to jail or getting each other killed. They have no problem with that. On the one hand, they're on the same side. And so all the overheated rhetoric amounts to nothing because they really agree more than they disagree. But they're also actually fighting against each other. They're just not fighting against each other for any of the reasons that we would really care about do you think okay do you think that, that this carries over to the, the radical left that the reason why the radical left is so vicious with each other is because of some sort of like we're a mirror reflection of all this stuff or i mean or... we are in other words we are manipulated by the powers that be um to sort of take sides in their conflicts we certainly are but also, and then the, all the way up to and including like COINTELPRO, I mean, you know, it's also true that the, that the left is actively disrupted by the state. Oh, yeah. But they're also liable to. In other words, they're happy to be so manipulated by the state to turn against each other, for sure. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, but I think that they're, I mean, uh, my interest is in more, uh, I guess, legitimate ideological differences on the left. That I also think are not terribly legitimate, meaning they're based on a lot of confusion, a lot of misunderstanding, if you will, but also a lot of like terror, a lot of like historical like force factors and coercion, you know, like Stalinism, obviously, you know, mm -hmm. like literally, if you were mm -hmm. a Communist Party member in the all the way up till 1991, if you were a Communist Party member in any Communist Party in the world, you know, you were taking your life in your hands, meaning if you went against in any way, even inadvertently, accidentally, if you went against the party orthodoxy, you could be killed, of course. Mm -hmm. 
Definitely. I want to. I want to. I want to read you a quote that I read to Ryan Grimm, and then we will. We'll move on to the mm -hmm. uh, Marxism, uh, the Century of Marxism essay. But um, here's a quote from this is from the World Socialist website mm. from an article called "Stop the Witch Hunt Against Vaccinologist Peter Hotez." And here's what it's, it says: The Biden administration has also promoted the Wuhan lab conspiracy theory which was invented by fascist ideologue Steve Bannon. <laughs> the legitimization of this fascist COVID-19 conspiracy theory has been aided and abetted by leading media outlets in the United States, including the New York Times and the Washington Post, which have deemed Bannon's Wuhan lab lie credible. The Intercept and Jacobin magazine have also promoted this conspiracy theory. Schellenberger and Taibbi claimed that three leading coronavirus researchers at the Wuhan Institute of Virology Ben Hu, Yu Ping, and Yan Zhu got COVID-19 in November 2019, citing only anonymous sources within the government. So, um, I mean, look, World Socialist website, they're the Northites. So I'll put on my Spartacist hat for a second. Yeah. They're the um, followers of Peter North. I forget his first name. David North. David North, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. The Northites, Fourth International is like the International Committee to Refound the Fourth International, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I would just say what the Spartans to say, they're bandits. You know, in other words, there's some serious shit going on there because they think that American Trotskyism, the SWP in the United States, was basically uh, infiltrated by FBI agents and one of their leading members, like Joseph Hansen, was an active FBI agent, right? And that, that is true, but that did happen, right? I mean, no, <laughs> I don't think I mean, so. I mean, it's well, possible, I mean, but I, I know that the FBI in, was yeah. heavily infiltrated, yeah, infiltrated the Maoist movements in the right, in but the they ascribe the ideological differences to this. Oh, right? In other words, there are real ideological differences, however, conditioned and manipulated, but. I think that we're bound to also take them at face value and treat them seriously. Um, mm -hmm. And whereas the Northites, like, you know, in other words, they're, I would say that they, you know, begged to differ with the Democrats. So they did this uh, criticism of the 1619 project, you know, mm -hmm. that was good. Right. Because basically it wasn't really their own. It was like, you know, uh, Eric Foner and James McPherson, and these people. Um, so sort of established historians who dismantled the 1619 project and they gave a, a forum for that. But they're really Democrats. They really are. In other words, like their criticism that like the Biden administration is colluding with the fascist conspiracy theory is like what? They're complaining that the um, that the Democrats are like trying to start war with China or something. I mean, right. I so. yeah? yeah. And so. And then, of course, they would have this notion that, like, I don't know, Trump is, like, soft on Russia, but virulently anti-China. And, you know, it's easy for them to point to someone like Steve Bannon, who I'm sure changes his mind about these things every few years. You know, like, it's just it's a, you know, another political opportunist um, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, right? Uh, and so they're just weighing in in a way that I think is very problematic, right? Well, I mean, one thing we can say with certainty is that Steve Bannon did not invent the lab. Well, surely he did not. Right. <laughs> right. He yeah. did not. And also he was not pulling the strings in the Trump administration. As Trump said, he was his own strategist. Right. But I mean, right. we're talking about, you know, yeah. Well, after Bannon was part of the administration 2020, mm -hmm. and yeah. we're talking about, uh, you know, a theory that was debated by, you know, Fauci and his, and all the you know health bureaucracy we know from leaked emails at the time and which the, the problem with the world socialist the world, world socialist website narrative the problem with it is that it's got an answer for everything in other words it really is a conspiracy theory namely it, you know fauci himself said that you can't rule out the lab leak theory he he thinks the zoonotic origin is more likely but he's mm -hmm. not as a scientist he's not going to rule out right and the northites they're like, of course, he's not going to rule out because he's he's, you know, hedging his bet. He's keeping open the possibility of joining this fascist anti-China crusade. <laughs> right. And it's like, oh, it's not. It's so not the ex like so the CDC, the former CDC head Redfield, he also is just anti-China. And that's why. Evidently, he, because yeah. it's U.S. imperialism, it's what we started out. They think that there's a thing, China. 
and there's right. a thing in the United States. And, you know, right. it's like some kind of weird, like, this is what the left does. They do, and this is why they are victims of the capitalist media. They, they reinterpret it as geopolitics, like, you know, strategy, you know, and, and I mean, this is a pastime on the left for a long time is to, you know, turn into like a risk game or something, you know, the game of risk, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) it's like, and I just feel like, you know, this is just not serious at a certain level. This is just not serious. And you do have to remember that the world socialist website is trying to recruit some young people who don't know any better, who are naive to pay dues, to pay the salaries of the people at the top of their little org. Right. They're like, you this know? is playing to what they perceive to be the biases of the millennial and Zoomer left yes. as well. Which means that they're trying to win people to Trotskyism from the Democratic Party. Right. And once you start, and by the way, the Spartacists are the same. Meaning right. they take for granted, okay, what we're, what we're doing is trying to convert Democrats into Trotskyists. Right. Right. And it's basically goes back to the popular front. So even these Trotskyists who are very anti-popular front, supposedly, Mm -hmm. are still doing this thing from the 30s, which is trying to be the left wing of the Democratic Party. Right. Right. Yeah. One of the things that made what I did at Zero different from most of the rest of uh, left media at the time was that I would actually target people like audiences that were captured by right-wing voices uh-huh. um and and i got emails from people saying oh you know i, I was really big fan of ben shapiro or more likely jordan peterson but oh, I right, right, right. to right. you mm-hmm. i i'm now very interested in marxism you got me to read you know marxist capital or whatever it would be and uh but that in itself was sometimes evidence of my being red brown right <laughs> you're just, you know? you're gonna be talking to young people who might be attracted to right wing ideas. I mean, mm-hmm. I think the way to deal with it is the Democrats are right wing, period. Oh, yeah. Right. In other words, Gore Vidal, straight up, you know, which I learned from the Spartacists, you mm-hmm. know, um, which is there's one party. It's a party of property and it has two right wings. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, it's it's Gore Vidal. Like, he's also complaining. He's like a patrician Democrat who's complaining about the Democrats. And so it has a kind of overstated hist- histrionic character. But this is tr- just true. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that, that dates from the LBJ era. You know, it dates from the Cold War era. And, um, you know, I think it's, it, again, what we have to do, we have to disenthrall ourselves from the slave power. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, the Democrats, and uh, to use a, a, a you know an abolitionist uh, catchphrase from the era of the Civil War, um, which doesn't mean like joining the Republicans by any means, mm. but again, like I think that one of the things that's going on now is that the left is falling victim to this idea that um, Tucker Carlson is a hawk, but he's just a hawk against China instead of Russia. Like you'll hear mm-hmm. this, you know, and there's just you know look. Both parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, have are keeping their options open and have people in them who prefer to be with China against Russia or be with Russia against China. Generally, we're living in the Kissingerian universe, you mm-hmm. know, and it spans both parties. There is a bipartisan consensus and it is not a neocon consensus or a liberal humanitarian interventionist consensus. It's what do you think about the blob? What do you think about realist consensus? There is a realist consensus to the deep state. And that means that they keep their options open. Nobody's died in the wool, anti-Russia or anti-China. They're all anti-Russia and all anti-China and they're all pro-Russia and Mm pro-China, meaning they're all for constructive engagement and peace through strength. And, you know, slapping the hand of the people who get out of line in the in the world order right they're they're all doves they're all hawks like you know it just, it's just not right and again when they debate each other in any given instance we have to understand these are not differences in principle these are differences in tactics right which is why i think it's important to like when you listen to right wingers and uh you know read the new york post or what have you to read them uh, as 
first of all, a, a, a source of, of facts that you're not going to be getting in other parts of the media. Um, and not because you're you're trying to figure out which team you're going to place a bet on. No. Right? No. The, and right. So, you know, I'm, I would never put a bet on any of these Republicans to accomplish any of the uh, of the goals. I mean, and I'm watching, and we will switch over. I'm watching Taibbi and Schellenberger and so forth uh, start to seem weaker and weaker as, as their crusade for free speech goes on. Like Taibbi's like, well, if we did a- admit that there should be a regulatory body for speech, wouldn't we want it to be fair? And I was like, well, why would you ever start with that start even beginning that sentence what 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 are you talking about and and, um because they uh, have to admit that there are reasons if you will and in other words you know i think we talked about this last time like mm -hmm. being free speech absolutists is a principle that in practice can't be realized under capitalism because capitalist management does actually demand for practical reasons to limit information yeah but their stance isn't I know. There should be. I know their stance is the legal, the legal yeah. system. Right. Not I'm not saying free speech absolutism like, you know, some utopian sense. I'm saying like the harm principle as codified into law uh, in the United States is, is should be the ground floor for speech in the United States and not some uh, additional disinformation governance board which will reg regulate what the speech based on. I think the socialists have to be in a position to push back against the state on anything and everything it does. Right. right. In other words, it's like the old ACLU, right, which was started by the socialists in the United States. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they took it upon themselves to challenge any and all restrictions all the time. There's a role right. for that. In other words, I think that there should be socialists who are doing that. No, or, right, and and that and, and they did that, and they did that within the legal system, yeah. and they would stand on and try to expand the protection that the right. First Amendment gave, uh -huh. and I think that was perfectly legitimate. And all I'm saying is that these, mm -hmm. even the big free speech, no, Taibbi's not debate, ready for that. In other words, Taibbi's not ready to adopt what is essentially a quixotic or a Sisyphean task. Right. He's looking at it much more pragmatically. In other words, he's saying that he, you know, grew up under a certain kind of journalist regime mm -hmm. that he was basically happy with and that now mm -hmm. that seems to be cut off. Yeah. And that's right. true. And I don't blame him for being unhappy about that because no, right? it was better no, under what? the, uh, well, you know, other the old. But then people are going to turn around and say, well, the Internet has changed things. And so we need. More yeah, to, right? but for a moment, the internet actually made it even more open. Uh -huh. But listen, let's okay, let's let's talk about. I I could go around and around on this. Uh -huh. I mean, you know, people are tired of hearing me talk about this. But uh, see, um, he's not gonna he's not gonna be in a position to be principled because he's not fighting for a fundamental transformation of the state and society. No, of course not. Right? No, no. But I would think that he could be as least as good as the ACLU. You know, I that, think that, it's hard now. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's hard. I mean, the ACLU ain't what it used to be, obviously. No, and that's for and again, there are reasons for that. Yeah. Um, okay, so look, let's talk about this essay. I've been I've, I've been allowing myself to be caught up in the ephemera uh -huh. of the moment. Uh -huh. But you wrote a, a, an essay called The Century of Marxism. Yes. And this was written, what, is 2014? That was when it was published? 2012, somewhere around there? Maybe 12, yeah, like a while ago. Like I would say 10 years ago. Yeah, let yeah. me... Let me yeah, 2012. Yep. It's a so, presentation at a Platypus annual convention. Right. So right around the time that the Mayan calendar ended and history right. ended. Um, so you in it, you define Marxism as a political movement that existed between the years 1873 and 1973. Yes. That Marxism is distinct from the ideas of Karl Marx and from the politics of Karl Marx. Um, and... Uh, I'm just wondering, like, how did you arrive at those dates, and how? Why is it that you exclude Marx's period uh, from the history of Marxism? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like strictly exclude it, but I would say that um, the problems that Marx and Engels were dealing with between, say, 1848 and 1873, let's say, um, were different 
only in so far as there wasn't a mass socialist party led by Marxist theory or ideology, right? In other words, they were participants in a broader socialist and communist movement. The first international had the anarchists and had various, you know, tendencies of socialism and they were happy. I mean, they certainly vied for leadership. They did, Mm -hmm. but they were happy to participate in a broader movement that didn't have to be ideologically Marxist as far as they were concerned, right? In other words, Mm -hmm. they had a contribution to make that they thought was crucial, but they didn't seek ideological hegemony. So the issue is, I mean, basically, I'm, my principle about the history of Marxism and the left is admit everything and concede nothing. And, you know, there are these like left communists and council communists and anarchists who are like, look, Marxism ruined the socialist movement by becoming the dominant ideology in the era of the Second International. Mm-hmm. Right. So the first party that is becomes a kind of officially Marxist party is the SPD in Germany. And it's founded on kind of a non-Marxist ground with the Gotha program, which Marx, you know, famously critiqued, but then it becomes officially Marxist with the Erfurt program. Mm. Right. And it leads the second international and the second international was not strictly Marxist, but Marxism held a ideologically dominant position. It doesn't seem to have come to a good end, does it? Right. In other words, that ideological supremacy of Marxism over the socialist movement and the marginalization of anarchism and other tendencies didn't pay off. It didn't give the world socialism. And indeed, it gave the world Stalinism. Right. So what do we make of that? So, of course, you know that I'm a student of Moish Pistom. And Moish has a very pat, to my mind, way of resolving this. Yeah, I can think of. Uh, can I give it a shot? Yeah. The the problem is that the Second International didn't fully understand Marx's own theory. They got it wrong, um, and we're in a position now to read more of Marx's. But writings. they were also historically bound to be caught up in capitalism. In other words, to be capital constituting and proletariat constituting. In other words, he thinks that a, a party like the SPD is constituting the proletariat and not transcending it. And that it's basically uh, constituting capitalism. And his term for that is state capitalism. Right. Okay. Right? And that's not entirely wrong, right? I mean, that's it's not definitely... entirely wrong. It's not. But the thing is, what do we make of that? In other words, does that mean that Bakunin was right and that Marx as a Hegelian was ultimately um, a worshiper of the state, right? And had created an ideological religion of the state, namely Marxism. And even though Marx himself didn't want to produce this, this is what he, despite himself, produced, which is a kind of statism, Mm -hmm. right? The ultimate form of statism in the name of socialism. Right. And mm-hmm. it looks very plausible now, doesn't it? Well, yeah. I mean, it looks it looks plausible for a long while, though. Yes. I mean, it's looked plausible since, let's say, uh, Khrushchev's speech, at least. Sure. Right, you know, yeah, yeah. but yeah. It's um, on, you know, I'm just saying, let's admit this. Right. But not concede to it. In other words, admit that Marxism is bound up in history, is subject to historical forces of capitalism succumbed even to the contradiction of capitalism that manifested within the movement itself, within the socialist movement itself. Let's admit that. Let's admit that Marxism doesn't have a panacea for that, doesn't have an answer or cure for that, but it only has a critical recognition that we have to work through things that way. In other words, there's no magic formula. It's not like if you avoid creating a mass political party, then somehow you can avoid becoming a counter-revolutionary force against the working class, right? Let's just say, to make a revolution, we have to risk being an agency of counter-revolution. And that's well, just... Well, let me, let me ask you a couple yeah. questions. When, when, when Moish Pistone points out correctly that mm-hmm. a good portion of the Second International's work was to create the conditions for a proletarian revolution by proletarianizing the world yep. um, by creating capitalism. Right. Um, uh, does he um, think that uh, that th- those conditions uh, con- are continuing to through to today? That 
we still yeah. are restricted in, in, and we have to continue that socialists, as they understand it, are still trying to create the proletariat and still well, trying they to capitalize are in danger capitalism. of that. They're in danger of that. In other words, he thinks that starting after World War II, there was a possibility of a, a more authentically socialist, like truly socialist, capitalist transcending movement. Mm -hmm. But in order to do that, it had to transcend a strictly proletarian socialist politics and also incorporate the new social movements into the struggle for socialism. So very similar to Dunyevskaya, Marxist humanist. Yeah. But, okay. that way. Very new left. It's very, very vintage new left. Right. But I don't see how that follows. I mean, the... the because, because you have to recognize that people are dominated by capital, not only in the wage relation, but also in other domains, like family structures and sexual practices and uh, cultural relations and even uh, in even in our psychology, you know, so he's even sympathetic to radical psychology. Right. He's saying they're onto something. Right. But OK. But my understanding is the reason why that the um, socialists had to uh, felt the, 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 the need to develop capitalism was because they believed that the proletariat was uh, uh, and labor was a uniquely free uh, subjectivity that that they were and and no, they were also, uniquely unfree. Well, in other words, that they were tasked most directly with overcoming the unfreedom of capitalism, and whereas everyone else was more well, likely let me, to let me, go along with it. Go let ahead. me explain what I mean. They were uh, uniquely free in so much as they were the constituting uh, material force creating society. Mm. And they were not doing that on the basis of a strictly fixed hierarchical set of relationships mm -hmm. that were limited, but they were mobile. Uh, they they had the ability to... Or they, they were propertyless. Property. Yeah, they were propertyless, and therefore they were no one's property either. And that, which means that they they owned themselves. And they, and they had nothing they, to lose but their chains. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But... But they had nothing to lose but their chains, and they were the force that was actually creating the conditions in the world, both. So I'll say this. So a couple of things. So first of all, this piece, um, 1873 to 1973, yeah. The Century of Marxism, will be in the second volume. The yeah, Mar that's what, that's what we're talking politics. about. Yeah. And um, there's another essay that will also be included in that second volume, which is where I talk about Moish. Mm. And specifically, and his notion of proletarian transcending versus proletarian constituting politics. Um, now, he backed off from that formulation himself. It, it, this is from like 1978. And then subsequently, he didn't really put it quite that way. And he did think that there was regression in the era of neoliberalism. That, that in other words, what he, what he said in, in cl the classroom and in private conversation but also I think he wrote it a little bit this way in later writings um, that, of course, in order to transcend proletarian socialism, first you would have to achieve it. Right. So he would say, well, of course, we do need the expropriation of the bourgeoisie. However, we need to understand that that will be insufficient to give us communism. And I'm like, well, Lenin knew that. Yeah. So his point was Lenin knew that, but the way he knew it was still insufficient because capitalism was still premature to be overcome in Lenin's time. In, in the Russia. Second international. No, which, in the which, Second International in general, because I would say, well, you know, Luxembourg agreed with Lenin, and he would say, well, she's a traditional Marxist, meaning she's also bound to this proletarian constituting. It doesn't matter whether it's Russia or Germany. The world was not able to overcome capitalism in that era. What's his evidence of that? That it didn't. Because it didn't, then it couldn't have. So a kind of right Hegelian affirmation of history. And he would say in, in later life, like in his final years, Moish would say, it took centuries to get into capitalism. It's going to take centuries to get out of capitalism. But in other words, we will overcome capitalism when capitalism is good and ready to be overcome. <laughs> right. And yeah. my attitude is, we, gotta, we have to do it, Moish. Come on. We have to actually do it politics, Right. Mm -hmm. And he was like, no, that's vanguardism. And that's just, it will turn into like Jacobin style, like state terrorism. Well, maybe. 
It might. <laughs> it might. Right. But, in other words, it, it very well might. And of course, that would be kind of revolutionary. It would. Yeah. Right. In other words, we should not celebrate that as like, yes, we want to do that. We want to send all the, you know, right wingers to the guillotine. Because, of course, it will inevitably you'll discover that all your comrades are right wingers, too, and they have to go to the guillotine. So, yeah, that might happen. But it also might not happen, right? In other words, um, and and of course, the real point is what's the result of all that going to be? So don't think that just because we good Marxists sit on our asses and don't try to vie for power, that the world is just going to be peaceful and nice and no one's going to go to the guillotine, right? No, the world's going to have genocide. People go to the guillotine and, yeah, all the time. All the time, right? They're going to send Trump to the guillotine if they wow. can. If they but, can, yeah, okay, right? If they if they're gonna at least lock him up, probably lock him up. Um, so I mean, he what, wants that too, Doug. I'll just say this: he wants to be inaugurated behind bars. Why? Because it proves his historical significance. Oh, right. No, I mean he is like going to his martyrdom happily. Like he's a cheerful warrior. He wants to be. Well, he's an old man. This would be a good way to go out. It is it really a great works. way to go out, right? He's not just some asshole on a reality TV show. He's not just a rapacious, like a uh, real estate mogul. He's like the last hero of America, <laughs> right? I mean, literally, he's like you know he wants to be Eugene Debs. Yeah, yeah, but doesn't For know fuck's that. Fuck's sake, he wants to be <laughs> Eugene Debs. Yeah. You know, he he wouldn't put it in those terms. No, he actually has been talking about. He's like, you know, the Espionage Act was made to attack socialists in the United States. But doesn't he also say we got to get rid of all the Marxists? Well, I mean, the Marxists that exist, we probably do have to get (laughs) rid of all of them, right? So my goal is just to, you know, hey, remember, I'm not one of those Marxists. Yeah, yeah, I just right. (laughs) <laughs> I don't want to be put up against the wall when the revolution happens. Okay, so like uh, I want to because I, I feel not like put us against the wall. The uh, you know the wokesters are going to put up. Put us well, up I don't want to be put up against the wall, no matter who. By it anybody, is. but just realistically, <laughs> yeah. who's going to put us up against the wall? Our comrades. Yeah, I know. Okay, so here's 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 the thing that I'm uh, I want to get at. Yes. Uh, because we've been talking, we end up talking about the state. We talk about moisture stone. We could, I could get sucked into talking no, about moisture stone. No, but state capitalism as a as a serious question. And where do you date it? Like in other words, like that's what I wanted to get at. I wanted to get at what's the history of state capitalism. If there is this critique of traditional Marxism, old style Marxism, whatever you want to call it, Leninism, but also Luxembourgism, whatever the whole kit and caboodle, historical old fashioned Eugene Debs style Marxism. There's a criticism of it. And the criticism of it was that it was like too implicated in capitalism itself. Right. right? And then that was proven by both social democracy and Stalinism. Yeah. And no, look, I think that's absolutely true. Okay. I'm just going to say that's true. But then the question then you in your essay go back to say, okay, so how do we want as Marxists to relate to the state and what is Mm -hmm. the role of anarchism and then the other way to think of it in your essay, I believe, is between, and this may be picking up on another essay you wrote, uh-huh. the split between imperialism and uh, anti-imperialism and anti-fascism. Yes. But which, if you think about it for a moment, both of those cr- tendencies are anti-state. They're both anti-state capitalist tendencies so they're against the fascist control of of the state you know, domestically, potentially, but they're also potentially um, apologizers for the state. In other words, if the state is fighting fascism, then you're on the side of the state. And if the state is anti-imperialist, then you're on the side of the state. If you're a third world nationalist, then out of well, imperialism, well, you can become a statist. It, only when you divide them into two different kinds of things, can you uh-huh. take that position? Right. Uh-huh. I think in my, so both are potentially anti-state and both are potentially pro-state. Right. So it's a funny you know, it kind of cuts across. So one of my points there is to deal with the fragmentation of the left that we inherit. Mm -hmm. We have to understand the nature of those fragmentations, various different fragmentations, anarchism, Stalinism, you know, or anarchism and statism, like social democracy and Stalinism versus anarchism or anti-fascism and anti-imperialism. We have to understand those as expressions of real contradiction. 
right? Not just good and bad, but like Marxism really succumbed to its own internal self-contradictions, but not just a kind of logical incoherence or poorly crafted argument or misconception, which is not really what Moish meant, by the way. He didn't think that that was the cause. He thought that it, the expression of a historical immaturity was a kind of incoherence that was revealed by history, right? So then the issue is we inherit this mess. What should we be? Should we be Marxist Leninists, left communists, anarchists, situationists, social democrats, democratic socialists? What should we be? Right? And realizing that actually original historical Marxism was all of those things and none of those things. And that Marx actually had a way of thinking about these things that could incorporate the contradictions of the movement itself, because the movement itself is part of capitalism. It aspires to be, in fact. In other words, today, of course, we are not part of capitalism, other than in the sense that anybody is part of capitalism. But we're not actively participating in the reconstitution of capitalism. I mean, maybe the DSA in some marginal way is by supporting Democrats. It's participating in the crafting of a new form of capitalism, but only very marginally. And so generally, we're not, we're not there. Like, we're not where the socialist movement was for a very long time, basically between 1873 and 1973, mm-hmm. that Marxism participated in the history of capitalism in a very active, profound, and consequential way. We live in the world that was created by the Marxist attempt to transcend capitalism, which became an engine of further capitalist development. Right? What, what was the, I mean, when I think about Marx's critique of the anarchists, one of the things that, uh, the first thing I think of is the fact that Marx would claim that someone like Proudhon had not overcome uh capitalist relations in his own understanding well really had not overcome a kind of petty bourgeois horizon of um social reality and politics in other words that basically marxists for a long time why they felt they had a clean conscience in suppressing anarchism in the movement in the era of the second international is that they thought anarchism was like a relic of the past that it was a kind of conservative reactionary kind of pre-industrial anti-industrial kind of petty bourgeois socialism basically and and a kind of petty bourgeois democracy they kind of lumped it in with that and that's true right but then they thought well we've historically superseded that and how do we know that because look huge capitalism as opposed to petty capitalism has predominated in the era of imperialism and lo and behold the working class is not fighting these local battles, right? But has formed mass socialist parties vying for state power. And that shows that we've left anarchism in the dust historically. What I remember from reading, you know, the po- uh, the poverty of philosophy is that, mm-hmm. is that Marx would specifically take apart Proudhon's uh, utopian suggestions as to how to create a, Free that they were reactionary utopias, right? Right, and what he was, but it wasn't a matter of like you know a, a sentiment. It was like technical. It was no, like, no, okay, no. It was how he conceived of things like, like property. We want, like, yeah, we want everyone to to take. A, I mean, if I'm remembering correctly, uh-huh, yeah, it was like like from every worker should have access to or or whole, you know own all of the products of their labor. Yeah. And have, right, as one example, maybe absolutely, we don't would say, and. And Marx would point out the impossibility of that no, being... the need for capital, the need for a social surplus, the need right. for surplus extraction and capital accumulation. That that's yeah, a I mean, real historical need. It isn't just a greedy rapaciousness. Right. And and also did, what Marx seemed to say was if Proudhon got his way, we'd have exactly the society we have now. I mean, Anyway, like, that's right. Because right, it would serve yeah. ideal, as ideological cover and it would be kind of helpless in the face of big capital. Of, of, and not only like these entities that are uh-huh. big capital, but the logic of capital, which Proudhon logic, is, that's right. that's is right. reproducing. That's so, right. so the anarchists then were headed towards the statism anyway. anyway. 
despite which was what they're out, which was born right. out. In other words, he he predicted that well because uh, Proudhon uh, basically went along with Louis Bonaparte in the same way that um, LaSalle, Ferdinand LaSalle, another like 1848er and former Marxist went along with Bismarck Mm -hmm. in Germany. And, you know, Bakunin seems unscathed by these things, right? Because he didn't have an opportunity. You know, so Bakunin and Kropotkin get a pass because they never like flirted with the statism that they supposedly opposed. So again, the question is, Anarchists are sort of helpless or disarmed in the face of the reality of the capitalist state. In other words, it's historical necessity. Right. And, you know, and that the struggle for socialism inherits that same necessity and isn't about undoing that and winding the historical clock back. Right. Mm hmm. And also that it's specific. So, you know, all the way up to the present, we have like David Graeber, who basically thinks capitalism is just the newest political economy of the state and the state as it goes back thousands of years, right? Debt Mm -hmm. the first 5,000 years or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Or, you know, his new history of humanity that was published um, uh, posthumously. So, you know, they basically say, well, the state is the issue. And then there are just different regimes of political economy that flow from the state. And of course, Marxism doesn't look at it that way. It looks at the state as not the cause, but the effect. But being the effect, it means that it, it is expressing a real historical need, however, a contradictory need. In other words, for Marx, the Bonapartist state does point to the dictatorship of the proletariat. Now, that's the kernel of truth, if you will, of the social democrats or the DSA, like to call themselves democratic socialists, and their kind of Ralph Miliband approach. In other words, they're like, um, yes, the state, it kind of is socialism and it just needs to be expanded to be realized. In a sense, that's true. In another sense, it's also not at all true, meaning, you know, the welfare state is not engaged in social provision right it's engaged in managing capitalism which is a very different thing when you say social provision do you mean the same thing as production yeah well in other words it's not like supporting the working class as active producers in society it might it might like keep it's catching it's catching the working class who fall out of work yeah um keeping an adequate reserve army yeah, and keeping but enough only social harmony. An adequate one, meaning that they let a lot of people go, right? Yeah. They know that you don't need all the poor people as a reserve army. They, they right. know that you need just some. I was right? reading Spencer Leonard's book um, in the beginning of his book on Bonapartism, and, yes. and, there's a, and there's a section in it, I believe this is where I, I got it from, it, is uh, where... Uh, Introducing Marx's own writings, that's right. Right, yeah, in, 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 in his journalism, and Marx is talking about how the, uh, the the constitution changed and the rights of the right to work yeah. was shifted into basically uh, a, this sort of uh, welfare state. He doesn't call it yes. welfare state right to be to receive um, some state money if you are poor, the right to avoid I'm being poor. desperately right. poor, like unemployment insurance instead yes. of the right to work. Mm-hmm. And he said, you know, uh, the right to work, of course, was a, a distorted demand, um, but it pointed towards it its own transcendence. Yeah, yeah, it pointed towards its own transcendence. Whereas, what society, you know, what modern society ever hasn't provided something for its paupers? I mean, yep. this is hardly a, a, an innovation. That's right. Um, and so that's how we should think about the welfare state. Whether it was today. the church, and after all, we have to remember that the church was the state. Right. The church was actually the state. In other words, we like to think of the feudal aristocracy as the state. No, it was the church. Right. Right. Yeah. And they, pl- they, and they provided, to, to, you know, to, to a limited degree, says. you know, like if you got sick, uh, Mother Teresa would pray over your body as you died. Things and like they that. kept their own people, like the nuns and the priests themselves were living in poverty Yeah. in order to help the poor people. Right. So they would yeah. give, give of their, of themselves to help the poor. For sure. Yeah. Right. right. So, I mean, 
again, the question is capitalism, meaning what are the needs of this in capitalism and how are those needs actually contradictory, right? Because capitalism isn't like a thing. It's not like a social system. It's a crisis and a breakdown of the social system, right? It's a crisis. Well, well what does that mean? Because I feel like on the one hand, it is a system. It has a system. It's a system of production where you can, where value, you know, commodity production primarily, right? It's a self-defeating system though. So what kind but, of a but it, But it's, it's, well, it, right. But you can create lots of systems that spiral, uh, you know, you know, or that are self-contradictory. It's a self-contradictory or it's a, a a, a system within that has its own internal contradictions, and it can be that contradiction can be spelled out and like quantitative. By the way, terms. this is an important point yeah. when it comes to historical periodization. Yeah. Why I emphasize the difference between bourgeois society and capitalism? Because bourgeois society, bourgeois social relations, you know, that developed within feudalism and came into a certain kind of emergence with the Renaissance and then flowered for several centuries. Um, is a social system, right? It's a system of exchange of commodity, commodities. It's commodity production and, and commodity exchange. The Industrial Revolution is a crisis of that. Now, where that crisis comes from, where that contradiction comes from, uh, raises deep questions about how we understand contradiction and also how we understand dialectics. So it's why Adorno, for example, has a distinction that goes back to Hegel, by the way, but certainly is there in Marx and Lukács between positive and negative dialectics. In other words, the dialectic that constitutes and the dialectic that destroys, mm -hmm. right? And why the issue in capitalism is the negative dialectic rather than the bourgeois society, which is the positive dialectic. Now, here's the wrinkle. We still live in bourgeois society. So we're not talking about two periods of history. We're not talking about that was then and this is now. What we're talking about is Bourgeois society did not experience the kind of crises and disintegration that we see in capitalism. But what keeps capitalism going is that it is constantly reconstituted as bourgeois society. And that's where Moish was wrong, by the way. In other words, Moish thought there was a pre there was a there was a bourgeois form of capitalism and there was a post-bourgeois form of capitalism. And that's what he considered state capitalism to be. That it was a post-bourgeois form of capitalism. I think, rather, and I think I'm on solid ground with Marx and with Marxism, historically, to say that it remains bourgeois capitalism, but in crisis, in deeper crisis. And in that sense, one could distinguish between the 19th and the 20th centuries, the a, a kind of early capitalism coming out of the Industrial Revolution, and then a late capitalism in the 20th century which is a term, you know, spite capitalism, like it's a German word, late capitalism. It's imperialism, it's monopoly capitalism. There was a pre-monopoly, there was a pre, you know, state capitalism, pre-imperialist form of capitalism in the early industrial era. It quickly gave way, like basically in Marx's lifetime, you see the consolidation of industrial production in capitalism, and then the um, crisis of that liberal industrial industrialism and its replacement by increasingly state-managed industrial production. Mm -hmm. But again, how to understand that? It's not like the state is really keeping it going. The state is rather bound up in its crisis. And that's why we can't even treat the state as a thing, really. Um, and so that's why it's not a simple matter of being like statist or anti-statist, but it's a matter of recognizing the nature of that contradiction. Why would the socialist movement disintegrate, fall apart, have a conflict between a statist socialism and an anti-statist socialism or a kind of statism and an anarchism? Which is very early on. This is the first international we're talking about, it is. right? But, but, but it's but, like very, very... Into, it's early intimations of it. It's post-1848 for sure, but it doesn't really like come into its own until you have a crisis of the Second International, right? Mm -hmm. And then you anarchism makes a comeback. You know, after the Russian Revolution especially, then it's like, okay, it's falling apart again. And so the mm -hmm. question is, how did the Marxist movement before World War I, shall we say, how did they imagine that they had sublated 
the statist and anarchist division. Yeah. How? Right? What? What? Uh, well, by incorporating yeah. it. In other words, by recognizing that the Socialist Party had two tendencies. It had a social action anarchist tendency, and it had a political action status tendency. And mm -hmm. keeping them in the same party was the way you could be cognizant of that contradiction in the movement itself. And again, understanding the dictatorship of the proletariat as a continuation of Bonapartist cap state capitalism, but also the political condition in which the social action of the working class could get the op upper hand over the capitalist state in a way that without the dictatorship of the proletariat, you'd always be foundering in this kind of disintegrating, you know, opposition within socialism of people who want to go for like state managed reforms now and those who want to withhold the civil social action of the working class away from the state. Right. Mm -hmm. And really the, the 20th century is the story of the state really taking over completely. Right. In other words, anarchism is there as a sentiment, but anarchism as a practice hardly exists. And again, the idea is, well, that's because those Bolshev those rotten Bolsheviks ruined it all for us. And it's like, no, there must be a deeper reason than that. Right. Right. And and the way you know that is because again, you can look back on the history and say and read, you know, look, the anarchists lost in the first international. Yeah. And and it was and the reason why was because they were not from put it very simply, they were not radical as radical as the Marxists. They didn't right. go as far as the Marxists did. Um and yeah, I, it, and then the other point to go back to your mm -hmm. um, essay, and, and I tell you what, in just a minute, we'll we'll, we'll split. The, this will be a, a breaking uh -huh. point, so we can uh -huh. do the second half in the Patreon. But mm -hmm. the other point you raise is that, um, I mean, you 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 periodize the century of Marxism from 1873 to to 1973, but there are some big moments in there. I cut that, it in half to to 1923. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's yeah, right. there's 1919 yep. and after, All right? Um, which is uh, so the really big moment is that there's Marxism from uh, 1873 to 1919 or 1923 maybe, and mm -hmm. then there's the memory of Marxism. Yes. So like, uh, what what? There are the pieces so, of Marxism. Pieces, right. memories, and then, yeah, you, the and you, of Marxism. Right, and you, you say it fragments in, into Trotskyism and into Trotsky and Adorno. Yeah, the, the two pl major res you know reservoirs or uh, you know placeholders for the memory, just the memory of Marxism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, that's not the memory of Marx's ideas, but that's the memory of the political a activity mm -hmm. of a Marxist party. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so how is it that? You picked those two figures, Trotsky and, and Adorno. And I think most people would look at picking Adorno as quick, quixotic, eccentric. They would. And they would also, I mean, they, you know, we should not ignore the fact that there's a great deal of, like, anti-Trotsky sentiment in the world. Like, I, I'll just right. point out that Moish Postone and Adolf Reed, my two mentors, they hated no one as much as they hated the Trotskyists. Why? Is that because they were Stalinists and they thought yeah, they could free the revolution I mean, in, I, in the so Soviet here's, Union? Here's why I choose those two, Trotsky and Adorno. Because, listen, from, from yeah. my Pacific uh, Northwest point of view, the yeah. people who hated the Trotskyists were anarchists. Yes, usually the okay, anarchists. They, right. So because they, if you took an anti-Bolshevik position, you right. would hate Trotsky first because he was closest to you, yeah. right? But but is that why? And whenever you've told me all that, you know, Adolf Reed and Moshe Stone hated Trotsky. I just always assumed, yeah, like the way Gita Borg. Well, they're kind of well, they they do on that level, yes. And they're also because they're right social democrats or even Stalinists in their conception at a certain level. I mean, again, that they inhabited that antinomy, if you will, of you know. So, but that has more to do with the failure of the '60s and how they resolved it for themselves in the '80s, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But I, the reason I chose these two figures is that they're the most hated. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah. Meaning that um, hated by everybody, right? And are frustrating and beguiling and, you know, just infuriating, right? <laughs> and so I feel like, okay, so what's that symptom? Why is it that Trotsky and Adorno have to be 
denounced, repressed, right? Vilified. Why, why do they have to be like actively mis misunderstood, you know, like very deliberately misconstrued, you know, and I think it's because they, they express a kind of a wound, right? There's a, there's a wound there. Um, and because of that, they're interesting and, and they can serve as kind of guideposts, right? So their historical significance is largely negative in character. And they do seem to be dead ends. It seems like, well, you don't want to end up in the same dead end as Trotsky or the same dead end as Adorno, do you? Right? And it's like, what if we are in that dead end? Right? Again, right. it's not like, let's avoid getting into that dead end. No, we're in that dead end. We've been there for a long time. Let's just mm -hmm. admit it and deal with it. Mm -hmm. Right? And what is the real nature and character of that dead end that people are so afraid of that they have to ward it off, right? Well, why don't we find that out in, in the, the Patreon? If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both.